everyone and welcome to episode 101 of the Wizards of Drivel podcast. Before we get started on this episode, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everyone who sent in nice words about our interview with Ricardo Fuller for episode 100. We're so glad you enjoyed it. That episode was made possible thanks to the support of our backers on Patreon. We don't have sponsors or advertisers, so if you want to help us out for next season and allow us to travel around the country producing episodes like that one, you can pledge just $1 a month on patreon.com forward slash wizards of drivel. Well, if you don't want to, you don't want to, and that's fine. It's pretty hard to follow up an interview with Ricardo Fuller, but we've done our best. In this episode, we chat to another city hero from that side. Liam Lawrence scored the first Prem goal at the Britannia Stadium, the goal that kept us up in 2009, and many, many important goals in our promotion season. Coventry away, anyone? We chat to him about that time at Stoke, as well as his frustrations about what has happened since. Go on, Stoke. Uh, first of all, uh, how did you end up joining Stoke? Um, I was at Sunderland at the time, and I'd had uh, a disagreement, we'll call it, with, uh, with Roy Keane. And we had a bit of a bust up in, in training, and it spilled out into the offices after, and a few harsh words were said and you know, I left the office and the last thing he said to me was just keep your phone on because you, you'll be out the door. Within an hour, my, my agent um, had been speaking to Stoke because I think he'd spoke to them previously because um, my agent looked after Danny Higginbottom and stuff at the, at the time as well. So Pulis had been in contact with my agent about certain players and he'd asked about me before I'd fell out with Keane. So... Luckily enough, I had uh, I had Stoke on the on the phone as soon as they found out that things had gone wrong at Sunderland, and then within two days I was down um, at Hull, ready to go for the game on Saturday. So it happened really quickly. Yeah, and when you joined Stoke, then like this this is like obviously a kind of massive part in the the club's recent history. The kind of Pulis coming back for that second time, signing. You, Rick, Danny Higginbottom, Lee Hendry, all that players, mm -hmm. all those kinds of players. And did you get the sense when you joined that, like, we were going to go places? Or did, did you kind of think that this is, yeah, okay, it's an all right championship club, but did you, did you see the ambition there from Tony and everyone else? Uh, it's a good question because, obviously, when my agent had rang me and, and said, look, you know, we've, we've had Stoke on... Um, He's assured me that they're, they're going to go for it and the, the chairman's going to back him and give him some money to to push because the, the, the manager wants to go uh, through the playoffs and stuff. So um, at the time, I, I think Stoke were like mid-championship and I'd not really took much notice of them. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. obviously we got promoted with Sunderland, then we got relegated and we were looking like we were going to have another go at promotion again. So, But when things happen at Sunderland and... I left, you know, I was assured by, by Tony Pulis as well in the hotel down at Hull that they were going to have a, a massive go for it. So that's all I needed to hear. Just, you know, I, I love the ambition of, of Tony Pulis at the time. And like, like you just said, they were starting to sign some, some good players. So it was the best decision I ever made. Yeah. And the, the, the kind of the seeds for the promotion were, were planted in that uh, 06, 07 season where we kind of just missed out on the the playoffs. When we started signing Leon Court and Ryan Shawcross for like one or two million quid, which, you know, back then was big, big yeah. money for Stoke. Were, was was mm -hmm. it, were you starting to get the sense that we could really push for promotion? Or, or was there a particular point in that season where you thought we can have a real crack at this now? It was towards the end of, of that season, what you just mentioned, when we just missed out on the playoffs. We were starting to turn teams over and we were so close to, to getting in the playoffs. You could just sense that something was coming. You know, we had me and, and Rick and Mama. Um, I just had the sense that 
we had a strong, strong side coming together and the dressing room was a really tight knit and close dressing room. And like you say, when we signed Ryan for, was it a million quid? Yeah. I was, I, no one knew yeah, him. No one had ever heard of him. And the big, tall, skinny kid came in the door and, you know, he absolutely took it by storm. He, he was, he was frightening that first, that first year he came in and he chipped in with a fair amount of goals as well in the, in the two years running up to us getting promoted. Yeah, and uh, like obviously there was a lot of iconic moments in that season, <clears throat> and none more so than the the goal against Coventry, where I think you just come back from an from an injury. And was it was it at that Coventry game that Pulis had played a, a speech from any given Sunday in the dressing room? He did. Yeah, uh, there was a <laughs> there was a vi video thing set up um, on a big screen, and he's told us all to get sat down before we went out for the game um, and he's put the speech on by Al Pacino you know where it's all about winning and how bad do you want it and all stuff like that and it just gave the lads a bit of a boost um, and in the end we obviously ended up winning the game with me and Rick getting the goals and I could just sense then after that that game that we'd done it I, I just knew yeah and um, obviously you took your shirt off in front of the Stoke fans Con <laughs> con converted quite a lot of Stoke fans to uh, to another team that day, but um, what like what what was the kind of driving force behind that Stoke team? Then why was it that we were able to get promoted? What what was Pulis's secret, if you like? Um, we weren't we weren't the most talented team in the league, but the the gaffer brought in players who he'd done his homework on which obviously this last couple of seasons, the club's done no homework on any of the signings they've bloody brought in. Mm. Um, the, the homework was done on players. He, he wanted grafters, hardworking people in training. He wanted a strong dressing room in terms of no, no one pisses about and gets away with certain stuff in training or before games or when you're away from the club. Do you know what I mean? It was just, we were so together that nobody came in and messed mess things up or mess the dressing room up for us and he brought that in and then obviously you obviously seen how hard working we were as a team and, and as unit it was it was all just it all just came together and you know we, we just turned teams over we, we were good at set pieces we had Rick up front we had Mama big John Parking came in at, at, at some point as well and it just worked it just worked. Tony Pulis knew what he was good at and the players what he wanted to be in the club to be good at and the rest is history. It just, it just all clicked in, into one place that season. Yeah, uh, as I was saying to you earlier, um, like we spoke to Rick last week and, and he talked about how Pulis like, managed to keep you motivated by quite literally sticking things on the dressing room wall, sticking like whenever someone slagged off Stoke, you know, you've you've got that on, on the dressing room. Was that kind of massive in that season where we stayed up in the Premier League, that kind of being written off by whoever it was? Well, he, he'd, he'd come in and show us new t news articles of managers caning us or, you know, Arsene Wenger having a pop at us or pundits having a pop at us. And obviously after the first game, people were writing us off when we lost at Bolton saying we were going to be down by Christmas. So... And I've said before, we had such a a hard, strong mental attitude from everyone in the in the team that we just was like, nah, I'm not having this. We won't we we won't be going down. And we just grafted in every game, and you know we made sure that the, the Britannia at the time, we made sure that the Brit anyone came to the Brit they were going to get it or they were going to get a tough game. Uh, and that, absolutely, and uh, and. I got the sense from from Rick as well, like that stuff would happen in in the dressing room in terms of kind of sometimes things would get a bit tasty. Yeah, yeah, I'd like Glenn Whelan and Abdullah Fai having a bit of a, a Barney or whatever. Um, but that, but it very rarely kind of seeped into on the pitch. And whenever people did have a go at each other in training, that was all quickly forgotten about. And was it important? Do you think, as a team, to kind of let your frustrations out on the training ground rather than on the pitch? 
it weren't like we were letting frustration out if we'd had a pop at each other or things got tasty in training. It, it, we were just that competitive that even if we were doing a five-a-side or a practice game, we were that competitive and everyone wanted to win. Things would spill over sometimes, but within minutes or after training in the dressing rooms, in the showers, in the canteen, it was all forgotten and everyone was mates again because everybody knew that we were just all competitive at the time of training and everything was forgotten about. Mm. Um, you've you've been in the the Sentinel over the last couple of weeks for for kind of comments on Twitter you've made about the the current Stoke team then, and I I get the impression from you and uh, kind of other players of your kind of era at Stoke that you're kind of really pissed off with how the current Stoke team or the Stoke team at the end of last season has kind of undone your hard work. It has. It's, it's, you know, when, when I came to the club, we didn't have a training ground. We were training down at the Mitch, but we had to get changed at the ground and drive down to the Mitch then drive back up to the ground, get showered and eat at the ground. And then, you know, over, over a couple of years, we turned it, turned it round, got, got promoted, got a new training ground, all state of the art. And with me and Rick and, you know, Ryan and Glenn Whelan, you know, we helped make that club what it what it is today and to see some of these fuckers that are strutting around and moaning and misbehaving before games and you know it it just hurts because it just feels that over the last year or two that things have slowly started to come undone and you know I've been doing the radio this year obviously and, and seen a lot of the games and some of the stuff I've seen at the end of the season you know when we've been relegated it just it just boils my blood to be honest mm. uh, you you kind of cite uh like ramadan sobby's agent trying to tie him out to other clubs you've got uh chupo moting taking selfies eric <laughs> peters in nightclubs before a huge game what what is it because i i've i've been critical of mark hughes and i've been critical of paul lambert you know as managers on this podcast but they yeah to what extent are they kind of responsible they might not be responsible at all and they might just have a unfortunate collection of dickheads on the hand like what <laughs> how, how how much kind of blame do those managers take if any well i wouldn't just blame marcus solely but he has a lot to answer for with the signings he's made and the money he's spent the people above him have got a lot to answer for as well i don't know how they've made some of these signings or why but the chairman wants to be looking down at these people and asking serious questions. Um, I felt a bit sorry for Lambert coming in after Hughes because he was dealt a, a rubbish hand, let's be honest. You know, he was working with a team that was spiralling down, you know, towards the bottom of the league. Players looked like they, they weren't up for the challenge. You know, certain things gone on, obviously, you've mentioned, you know, Chipper Moting taking selfies on the, on the pitch at the end of the season and, Shakiri missing the penalty and then high fiving the keeper at Swansea. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And now you've got these people, Ramadan. You know, I could understand if he'd had a, a good season, but he's been average at best at times. Um, and now they're all saying they've got all these Premier League clubs after him. I, I think not, to be honest. Yeah. Um, like, the, you get the sense that there needs to be someone or a group of players in the dressing room telling them that what they're doing is knobbish and you know completely not the attitude that you that we we as fans want to see and presumably like some of their teammates want to see because i wonder what the likes of joe allen and ryan shawcross make of hesse and uh berahino sometimes I, I mean what what would what would these guys have been like in your dressing room would you have would you have tolerated it at all no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have got away with it. You know, certain certain things have happened. People being constantly late. People going out before games. You know, we would have we would have nailed it in house in the dressing room. We had a, as I've said, a lot of strong characters and a, a lot of big strong lads. You know, if there's people messing about and affecting us on the pitch and affecting our results, you know, it, it's our livelihood. You know, if we're losing games, it affects our lives. Not, never, not even to mention the supporters, you know, uh, what they've had to see and, and put up with this year has been poor and 
I can understand the frustration and, and they want questions answered. So, no, it, they wouldn't have got away with it in our dressing room. But as well, these types of players wouldn't have been brought into the club. Mm. Um, Pulis, it, Pulis wouldn't have had them type of players in. Yeah. Is it true that uh, you have either applied for a job on the coaching staff or like been in, been in talks for a role at Stoke? kind of more well, recently i'll tell you what happened i went i applied for a job last summer um i wanted to get into the academy you know work my way in and try get something and, and work my way up and become a good coach and help the the youth if you like at stoke you know see if i could and enhance some of the youth players there but it took a long time because of the police checks you know they do the the checks you know for yeah. all this paedophilia and all the all the criminal stuff mm -hmm. um, and it took a long time it took about seven or eight months for it all to come back so they they go they come back to me um and they said there was three jobs available there was two part-time jobs and one full-time job with the under 13s and they came back to me and said you can have the part-time job <laughs> right. working monday night saturday morning and sunday morning so you know, I was expecting something more permanent. Yeah. So I wanted, obviously, the, the full-time job. I feel that everything I've done to towards the club and around the club and around the Stoke area, that I would have been more than qualified. You know, with my past experiences and everything I've done in the game, my knowledge would have been brilliant for them, for them young lads. But like I said, they offered me the part-time job and... I went, I started going down the media route and doing radio and some TV stuff. So, you know, I'll never rule it out. And I do, I do want to coach and I'd love to be involved at Stoke. You know, that, that's no secret. I'd love to be in there. But for me, I just thought that the part-time job was a, was a no-go at the time. Did you feel it was a bit of a, a bit of an insult after kind of waiting so long that, that they come up with a part-time yeah. job? Yeah, I was a bit pissed off, to be honest. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know who got the full-time job in the end, but... I've not seen any ex Stoke players, if you like, that have done what you know the likes of me, Rick, and Matty Everington have done for for that club. I've not seen any of us getting offered jobs full time in there. Have you? No, and it's only kind of now that there's uh, talk of Roy Delap joining uh, Gary Rowett's uh, staff at the club, but th but that's come because he had to get a job at Derby rather than a job at Stoke in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... I, I, I completely get your frustration and and I guess it comes down to uh, what a lot of fans have been feeling at the moment with Stoke is kind of they they lost their wh whatever you characterise that they lost the Stoke identity if you like when yeah a, a lot of you we, we kind of built a, a solid foundation off of your your group of guys You're, you were the guys who took us up helped us stay in the Premier League and then uh, Pulis kind of the performances waned a bit so Mark Hughes came in breathed a breath mm -hmm. of fresh air in for a bit then he started to fall off a cliff and then in kind of the last two years we've been really really poor and a lot of people have said Stoke have lost their identity what do you think like the Stoke identity is if if you can define it well I used to speak to people like my friends, obviously playing for other teams. I'd speak to them on a Friday night, you know, when they were due to play us on the Saturday and they'd be like, Oh, I'm dreading tomorrow. I'm absolutely dreading playing you lot there. They used mm -hmm. to hate it. The fans would be loud and behind us. We'd be a horrible team to play against. And not many teams had come to the, to the Brit and turn us over. Even the top teams, you know, we, we give them a game at times. So for me, the Stoke identity and, and what it's been, for the last 10 years, obviously it's changed the last few years because they want to see a bit more football played and a bit more exciting football. And I get that. I get that from football fans. But you've talked about the Stoke identity and the Stoke identity is being a horrible team to play against and it not being easy to go down to the Bet365 and play. Whereas this season and last season, teams are waltzing up. Bottom, I'm talking bottom end of the Premier League teams are waltzing up now and playing Stoke off the park. It wouldn't have happened when, when we were there. We'd have been kicking people in the air, 
we'd have been we've just been all over them and you know as I said people have just come and found it too easy to play against us yeah absolutely um to kind of take you back to that first season in the Premier League which you kind of talked about there the the fans being on top of on top of the other teams and everything like like we we did get the sense that in, we we might have been kind of bigging ourselves up a bit, but we as fans felt like we actually were making a real difference, not only in terms of hammering the other team, but also lifting you guys up as well. Was that something you re like actually felt on a game by game basis? Oh, I was, it was honestly I can't tell you the difference that you fans make when you're literally right on our shoulders, honestly. When we're playing well, or if a tackle goes in, or we score, or we have a chance, it, it was so loud. You know, it, that was a big part of the reason why people hated coming and playing at Stoke as well. The fans, I think, in the first year, didn't you get voted the loudest crowd in the Premier League? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was awesome. And you know, when when the fans used to sing Delilah, it used to make the airs on the back of my neck stand up. I used to love it. Yeah, and, and it kind of, um, it, it was especially like unusual for me, I've never seen Stoke in the top flight before, but to see a full, full crowd, and then the, it kind of started, you couldn't have picked a better ho home game to start the season on, that Aston Villa game, where obviously you scored the penalty and then we, we nick it in the last minute, and just just seeing a, a full Stoke crowd fully behind the team, and did you get a sense after that oh, that well, it wasn't the opening game. The, the opening home game after uh, uh, against Aston Villa. Sorry that that yeah. we were actually gonna compete and it, we weren't gonna be like going down gently. No, I knew, I knew. I know we'd lost at Bolton, but we never had that mentality where we were like, "Oh, this is going to be a long season." It was more of a like, "We've got Villa next week. I can't wait." Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So when we played Villa we gave them a right game and obviously the, the I scored the first penalty and played Rick you know for for his goal if, if that was Michael Owen or Ibrahimovic who scored that goal they'd be playing it back for years Do you know what I mean it was mm. it was a thing of beauty it was an absolute thing of beauty so but yeah we, we went and beat them and we just, we just knew we just knew we, we look forward to every game do you have a, a kind of favourite game or a favourite moment from your time at Stoke then? Was there a game that kind of like summed up why you why you enjoyed playing for us? Honestly, every time I played. Honestly, every every time I played was a was amazing for me. Um, obviously there's goals that I've scored and things like that that stick in your mind, but just every, playing every game and being able to play for, for a club that I, I was so attached to. And wear that Premier League badge on on my arm. It was, I was just proud every 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 time and every even every time I'd walk into the new training ground, I'd just felt a sense of pride. You know what I mean? Mm. And that is exactly what kind of fans want to hear from players. But you, it's very easy for players to say that. But I think what you guys did was actually show it on the pitch as well. It's 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 so easy for a new signing to kind of make all the right noises, but you've got to deliver on the pitch and like you you were kind of uh a, a massive so you, obviously you're a massive part of of the tony Pulis team and that kind of aggressive style of play and and all the rest of it but you had real quality and you scored some real quality goals for us you were the man on set pieces as well for an obvious reason so w what kind of uh things did Pulis do to kind of bring that side out of your game where possible we just used to work on you know thursdays and fridays were solely set pieces corners throw-ins because he knew what we were good at he knew our strengths i mean look at the size of ryan and houthi when he came in and danny higginbottom you know rory de Lapp, he was he was a big tall unit and we got ricardo and mama so we used to work on what we were good at don't get me wrong we could play at times we really could. We could play, and you know, we we'd do set pieces on a Thursday and Friday, and he'd just have me and Matty Everington or Glenn Whelan on them, and we'd just practice them for a good hour. You know, and you repetition's good. So when you get there on a Saturday and you get a corner or a free kick, eleven people know exactly where the ball's going. Eleven of our players knew exactly where the ball was going to be, and where their runs were going to be, and 
you know, it, it worked a treat and we scored many goals from corners and, and bloody throw-ins. Yeah, it, like the yeah the amount of goals uh, Leon and Ryan scored in the promotion season was was incredible for centre halves really. Um, yeah, uh, you you mentioned kind of a recruitment there in your kind of annoyance with the way things have gone at Stoke and because again when we spoke to Rick he was like who is this Mark Cartwright guy. I think I think I think he actually used that word. Who is he? I don't know. I, I know he did. I heard it. I heard it on your podcast. I don't know who the fella is either. <laughs> I, 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 and so, how did how did it work under Pulis then? What was it? Literally every signing came through him. Yeah, when when my agent uh, rang Stoke and he spoke to Pulis straight away, there was no, you know, Rudgy used to do a bit. Remember Rudge? Yeah, John Rudge, yeah. Rudge, yeah, Rudge used to do a bit and, you know, finalise some of the stuff, but Pulis identified what and who he wanted and he would be the first port of contact for the for the agent and that. You know, it was so straight down the line and everyone knows what's happening. Not now. These people, I've heard crazy rumours this year about chief execs or people above, you know, putting DVDs on people's desks saying, sign him. That, have you heard that, that? I've not. I've not heard that exact rumor, but it sounds very uh, Mike Bassett, England manager. To be honest, it's yeah. Um... Honest, honestly, people are saying that there's been DVDs thrown about and saying that we should sign him, we should sign this player, and you know, the, the, some of the some of the signings. My goodness. Yeah, you could and... have had bloody me, Rick, Matty Everington, and Ryan Shawcross for <laughs> what some of the lads' wages are on. It's it's madness. Yeah, and there's there obviously had to be some kind of freshening up last season because the season before had ended quite you know meekly or whatever, and the the really annoying thing wasn't so much that oh we'd sold the wrong players it was all we just replaced them with with absolute crap and we the the guys we spent massive money on didn't work out but the players we spent no money on didn't work out either like Hesse on loan Fletcher on a free. Uh, Chupo moting wasn't that much either, and it's it smacks of something going seriously, seriously wrong at that recruitment level. But no one seems to be able to own up to it. I, I no. don't think there's there's been any kind of uh, whether it's Tony Scholes, Mark Cartwright, or Mark Hughes. No one's saying, "All right, hold my hands up, I cocked up this transfer." No, it's strange that. <laughs> I don't know what's the word. Not strange because nobody's been sacked, but it's strange no one, no one's been fingered, you know, and said mm. he, he's the one that signed him. He's gonna get. He's got to go. He's gonna get the sack. If I was a painter and I went to someone's house and they wanted their walls painted white and I painted them black, I'd get sacked. Yeah. These people that have come in and made these signings and got the club relegated, they've, they've got, they've got to answer for them. And I think that's what's pissing the fans off as well, that no one's being fingered, if you like, and being called out. So they've got to get it right this year, that's for sure. They've got to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but obviously, like, bad signings happen at clubs and there were players under Pulis that didn't work out. I mean, Dave Kitson didn't score at all when he was the, the club's record signing. And, and how, how would kind of... How, like what? What was the story with like Kitson? Do you think? Uh, what? What? What was it? Did he just not suit the way we played, or was he not the right kind of character for the dressing room? No, Kits is actually a, a, a good fella. He's a he's mm. a good fella, and he's he's a good bloke. He was a good player as well. I just think with with Kits, he was the type of player, and I'm not saying he's the type of this person. He's the type of player that needs a manager to put his arm around him and make sure that Kits knows he's the number nine. Do you know what I mean? He'll, he'll be the, the one starting where it wasn't it wasn't the case. He would he would start a game, maybe then he wouldn't play and then he would come on or then he wouldn't play again. And it just sort of spiralled from there. And then I think Kits ended up having words with, with the gaffer and he fell out of favour quite quickly. So that was, that was from... That's all I can tell you on the Kits thing, to be honest. Yeah. Um... Obviously, like Tony Pulis is no stranger to it to a falling out with a player, and 
we're 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 slowly piecing together what happened at what happened at Arsenal. Like, was was that an experience? You'll that, never uh, know. Oh come on! <laughs> You've all left I now. Can... I, I, you know what? If I wasn't still so close with Beats, I would I would tell you, but I, I can't really say. Oh, what do you know? Tell me what you know. Um, I know th- right. I know there was a headbutt, and uh, Rick described it as perhaps a bit more vicious than Zidane's on Matarazzi. Uh, which, right. well, uh, it's um, kind of below the neck where the mystery lies, to be honest. Right. So two grown men naked. Yeah, that's what that's what we've heard. Right. Okay. All right. All right. That's, so you've that's pretty not... much got most of it. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> You've pretty much got most of it. Is, is there is there more to it? Um. Well, Beats reacted. Put it that way. Okay. Right. So, the, we, well, that's it. Have... I'm not telling you no more. You get me in trouble. <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, get a proper team on this on this story then. Um. <laughs> and and speaking of uh, great Stoke mysteries. Like we we put out on Twitter, like any questions for Liam Lawrence, and basically there's a, a few along a similar vein. Uh, did you really trip over your dog? Yes. Yes. What what kind what yes. kind of dog was it? Where where did you did 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 you trip over the dog? Right. So it was in the night, and our stairs goes up and then halfway up it goes to the left so it sort of turns a bit and the dog used to sit in the middle of the, the stairs where, the, where the, there was a large step where it turned um, and he used to lay there in the night and I've come down in the night not seen him, fell over him and tripped down the stairs and done my ankle Okay <laughs> yeah, uh, Like an idiot But believe it or not, some people don't believe that I know, I know they don't. I get asked this quite a lot, mate. <laughs> um, right, I, I, I'm going to take you at, at your word because you've been uh, so like nice to us in in speaking to us. In the right. So I'm not going to uh, I'm going to pull at that thread. Um, I'm going to push it. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, another one of the questions we had come through was uh, what 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 was your favourite goal for Stoke? Oh, my favourite. Um, obviously, the one at Coventry, in terms of importance, that one will stay with me till I die, that one, because that was that was a special and, and oh, seeing the Stoke fans going absolutely bonkers was, was something to, to see. Um, the best one, I'd probably say, was against Dipswich in the promotion year or, or the one at Hull when we stayed yeah. up. Um so yeah, there's a few, but the, the the one against Blackburn as well, towards the end of the season. Mm. You know, we needed to beat Blackburn, and it wasn't a very good goal, but it was just again an important goal. Yeah, in off the keeper in the post, wasn't it? If I remember rightly. Well, um, he I've cut in inside the box and hit it with my left, but he he he's thought I'm going across him, so he sort of dived already, but I've pulled it near post, and he's just stuck out his arm. As he's diving the other way, and it's gone under his arm and gone in. Yeah, that, that was that was just a massive moment. In, like you, you've scored a load of kind of crucial goals in the club's recent history. Like you said, the Coventry one, the Villa one, Blackburn, etc. Uh, how did you end up uh, leaving Stoke then? What was the what was the story there? Um, I was in and out the team quite a bit more than I'd like to be. I, I you know I thought I should have been playing and. I'd gone to see the gaffer and said, look, you know, I want to play more and, I, you know, if anything comes up, sh- should I maybe leave? And he said, no, I don't want you to leave. You don't have to leave. You'll get your chance. And it was transfer time and um, the club had gone in for Mark Wilson and Pulis came to me and said, do you want to go for Port- to Portsmouth? We've had Portsmouth on the phone for you and Kits. Um mm. And I was like, well, Portsmouth, it's a long way, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, I said, I'll see. And I went away uh, international duty, I think it was, with uh, with Ireland at the time. And Steve Cottrell kept ringing me phone and ringing me and ringing me. My dad was on the phone saying, don't leave, stay. And 
anyway, I ended up making the decision to to leave. And in terms of football, it's the worst decision I've, I've ever made. Uh, did, so, did you think you could have you could have carried on a bit bit longer at Stoke and kind of uh, cemented yeah. your place in the team? Yeah, easy. I was, I was I was still fit, still young. I was twenty nine, I think, at the time. Twenty nine, yeah. I was still still physically in peak condition and still had quality. So I should have stayed. I should have just kept my head down and stayed, but I didn't. And it was it was the worst decision I'd made football wise. Uh, that, that that saddens me to hear because you were a real fantastic player for us and uh, you kind of were such a massive part of like probably the best moments of my Stoke support in life anyway so um, I'm yes. just con just conscious of time so uh, I first of all want to thank you for speaking to us and thank you for uh, for those memories really uh, do you have any kind oh, no of problem at all Cheers. Uh, do you have a, any kind of message for the Stoke fans then, uh, like looking ahead to the championship, or do you have a, like a, a kind of a message to the the club as a whole? Like, what what do we like all need to do to kind of like get back on track as a club? Well, I'm no I'm no football guru and expert. You know what I mean? What I I'll just say what I would like. I'd like the club to have a clear out of some of the players and some of the poison that, that's there at the minute get some fresh blood in, back the manager, um, don't make the same mistakes in transfers, don't rush into to things. I know everyone wants to see new players coming in, but make sure the, the homework's done on players. You know, I would say that to the club. And I would say to the fans, you know, treat this season as, as an exciting season because, you know, if we if we go and get promoted again at the end of the season, there'll be, the City will be in party mode, won't it? It'll be... It'll be another amazing season where, where Stoke have got promoted. Um, I know it's not some of the greatest fixtures and, you know, they want to see Premier League football, but at the end of the day, the club, club's been relegated. It's a simple fact. Just get on with it now. Look forward to the next year and just get behind, get behind the manager, get behind the team and let's all get together again because I feel over the last couple of years, the club's det detached itself from... The supporters and the players are detached from the, the supporters. I just want everyone to get back to how it used to be, the, the, the good, hard-working family club that it that it was, you know, a few years ago.